we thought decarbonising cars was going to be challenging. How about trying to decarbonise something that has to transport 40,000 of them? Well, that is what the shipping industry is facing, an industry which represents 2 to 3% of the world's total emissions. Small challenge, this is definitely not. But what about if we started to harness resources that are clean, free, abundant, and we started using over 6,000 years ago? This is The Fully Charged Show. That natural resource is, of course, wind. And we've come to Stockholm to visit Oceanbird, a company owned by shipping giant Valenius and Alpha Laval, to see how they're harnessing the wind to make shipping more sustainable. Cargo ships are absolutely enormous. It's actually difficult to overstate just how enormous they are. The biggest one in the world is 400 metres long and can carry 24,000 container units. That's enough space to carry 48,000 cars. And the thing is, is that cargo ships are all about economies of scale. The bigger the boat, the larger the cargo capacity, the smaller the shipping cost. And therein lies the challenge for wind-powered or wind-assisted technologies. It's difficult to make a boat of that size that's powered by the wind. Oceanbird thinks that they have the solution, and their maiden voyage will be on a 200 metre by 40 metre car carrier capable of carrying up to 7,000 vehicles. So whilst that definitely puts it at the smaller end of the spectrum, it makes it substantially bigger than this one here. Here is their 7.1 metre prototype, which they're using to figure out how to make this whole thing possible. Oceanbird has some big ambitions and is making some equally big moves to get there, including a very interesting partnership with a certain Swedish supergroup, but a little more on that later. So I have to admit, I expected something like Pirates of the Caribbean with, you know, material sails. This is very different from this. This looks more like it's got four aeroplane wings vertically. How does this actually work? Uh, exactly as you said, it is the same as an airplane wing that we flipped 90 degrees. One difference is that they are symmetric. On the airplane, since they only need to lift, they are asymmetric because then it's more efficient. We need to go in all directions. How it works is that when we put a wing, a something, a flat plate would work as well. In an airflow, the wind impacts it and it deflects. Because we put an angle to it, it deflects the wind and that generates a force. But I guess the critical difference is that normally on an aeroplane wing or actually even with a sailboat, you have one sail, maybe maximum two. There are four here. Presumably yes. that makes it more than four times more complicated. I don't know if it's four times, but it is definitely more complicated. With a normal sailboat, we would have normally a big a main sail and a small one in the front. And they're very close. We know that they interact a lot. And that, actually, we know quite well how. But these have a very different shape and very different location. So they don't interact in the same way. So we cannot take the knowledge from the sailing. We cannot take the knowledge from airplanes. We need to kind of mix and create. Fully automated wind-powered ships are a completely new field of research. So what exactly did the team need to do to map this uncharted territory? So this 7.1 metre prototype is here to provide loads of data and loads of information that tells the engineers how this is responding to the wind. So there are a few things to point out. First of all, we've got four wings. They are essentially aeroplane wings, but they're through 90 degrees. And so instead of creating lift, they're creating forward thrust. Each has a number of sensors on them. These are this, the black dots that you can see at various heights along the wing. And these are measuring the pressure difference between the front of the wing and the rear of the wing. And it's that difference in pressure difference which is creating that force. The tags look like they're doing something technical, and they kind of are, but really it's to show the engineers how windy it is and how the wings are responding to those windy conditions. There are six sensors across the boat. They are measuring wind speed and wind direction, so again, the engineers can calibrate all of that information. The shipping industry plans to reduce emissions by 70% from 2008 levels by 2050. This is a massive challenge. Container ships consume hundreds of tonnes of heavy marine fuel every day, and with such high energy consumption, batteries currently don't cut it. So shipping giants are exploring a wide variety of other options, from green hydrogen to nuclear. But they all have their drawbacks. And despite that, wind seems comparatively less popular. So does it actually make sense for container ships? 
wind is the obvious solution. It's always there. It's free. There is a lot of energy in there. That's the most logical way to use it, to go across the oceans. I mean, wind has been there for thousands of years, and, and I think it's been proven as a, as a great way of, of moving ships uh, forward. I think also wind has a lot of other great advantages. I mean, of course, it's free of charge. Uh, so with the concern now of oil prices and things like that, it makes the, the operating cost uh, much less. And you should also remember that when you're now building a new ship, that means that you need to think of what will the fuel price be 2040, 2045, because that will have an impact on it. Wind, you know, will be free. So that has a great impact for that. The shipping industry is responsible for 2 to 3% of the world's CO2 emissions, which means if it was a country, it would have the same emissions as Germany. But it's also responsible for transporting 90% of global trade. That means 90% of the stuff that you can see around you right now, from food, clothes, electronics, cars, and all the materials that make them. So radically reducing or just stopping shipping isn't an option. We need both global trade and the solutions to decarbonize it. With the role of this prototype, I'm guessing is to really understand the behavior in different conditions. The beauty of doing it in real condition that we don't control is that things happen that we wouldn't predict and we get realistic conditions as well. It's going to be the same condition the real ship sails on, so the wind moves all the time. It changes in speed, it changes in direction, it can be very slow changes or very abrupt ones. And we get everything, so then we can really adapt the control algorithms to these real conditions. How representative is, is this of what will be the 200 meter full-scale version? Oh, that's a tricky question. It is still similar in how it, how it looks will be similar, how it behaves to the wind changing, that's going to be similar. That gives us a lot of information about how the real ship would behave. We cannot just take that result and scale it up, but by comparing different ways of doing, we know which one will work better. This all sounds wonderful, but what's the timeline for their first commercial voyage? For 2024, we will put on the first uh, wing on an existing vessel. So that will be in early 2024, and that means also that we can then optimize the system, really see how it behaves and how it's sailing in, in, in real conditions. And then for 2026, we will then have the, the large, uh, fully sailing vessel in that way. So we see it as stepwise that we move small steps in order to, to reach the, the big goal. The year is 2050. Can we see Ocean Bird crossing the Atlantic? All of, I, I hope most of the fleet will have wings. Probably not just Ocean Bird. Like, this one is going to be old by then, hopefully. In 2050, you will see a lot more of them. The challenges are to really make it happen, but I think we can actually do it. I'm very confident that that will work. I think right now what's the most limiting is the will to do it. More ship owners and shipping companies need to be willing to do a change and then, it, then the technology will be developed. I'm not scared of that. The, the challenge is enormous, uh, it's huge, uh, like it is for all industries I think going forward and you should take in mind also that for the shipping industry is a quite conservative market. Uh, vessels are lasting for a long time. Um, so everything that we do now will have an impact also in 2030, 2040. So it's important to start already now and also taking step uh, by step. And before we forget, that illustrious partnership we mentioned? There is a partnership uh, between ABBA Voyage and Valenius. ABBA are very interested in new technology and they approached uh, Valenius uh, regarding that and was interested in the ocean bird concept regarding uh, environmental things. So it actually fits quite well. Yep, you guessed it, ABBA. And apparently future ships may even be named after ABBA songs. I'm hoping they opt for Take a Chance on Me and not SOS. Ocean Bird have a long way to go, there is no doubt about it, and 2050 isn't that far away. We do not have time to just sit back and do nothing. But what is so encouraging is that a principle that has existed for so many years, since time began in wind power, is now finally being met by the technology 
and the appetite to bring it together to make some really sophisticated and commercially viable solutions such that we could see wind power powering across the Atlantic Ocean, moving our goods. I've got my fingers crossed for Ocean Bird. Please do let us know what you think in the comments and like and subscribe and do all of the other bits and pieces as well. And as ever, if you have been, thanks for watching.